I want to show you how easy it is to photograph deep space using your Fujifilm camera. A lot of people are surprised that Fujifilm cameras are actually really, really good at photographing deep space, and I'll tell you why in a bit. I want to go through the different types of gear that you're going to need to photograph deep space, and I'll tell you right now, you don't need a lot. Then I'll give you some tips and tricks on settings that you can use for photographing deep space. Then we're actually going to go out into the field so you can see what the process looks like so you know exactly what to expect when you go out there and shoot deep space for yourself with your Fuji camera. For deep space astrophotography, the fundamental thing that we do is take multiple exposures of the same target, as many exposures as we can. That's why when you look at deep space photos and people talk about, I took eight hours or 10 hours or three hours of a certain target, they actually went and took a total of three hours worth of images. But that three hours might equate to multiple 60 second exposures or multiple two minute exposures. We're shooting objects that are barely brighter than the background level noise. But when we take multiple exposures, the position of that background noise changes through every shot. But what doesn't change is your target. So when you take tons of exposures and stack them together, the noise gets wiped out and the detail in your target remains. For the last couple of years, I've been shooting with the Fuji X-T4 camera for all sorts of astrophotography, deep space, time lapses, Milky Way, you name it. Now you may have read online that the Fuji X-Trans sensor excels at astrophotography because it lets in a particular wavelength of light that's very abundant in the universe. And we call that wavelength of light hydrogen alpha. And that wavelength of light actually sits on the red end of the spectrum. The sensors have a filter that's built in front of them. And those filters only let in a particular amount of light. Now, if we're talking about a Sony or a Nikon camera, when you look at that hydrogen alpha wavelength, it only lets in a small amount of it. But when you compare that to the Fuji X-Trans sensor, this camera lets in more of that wavelength of light. When it comes to deep space astrophotography, we talked about the camera, the Fuji camera. That's why you click this video, it's because it's about deep space with Fuji cameras. So I assume you have one. What other things do you need? You'll need something like this, a telescope or a lens, and a tracking mount. Some of you might be saying, oh my gosh, I have to get a telescope. <sighs> Just another thing I have to buy. Let me stop you right there. You don't need to go out and buy a telescope if you already have a long focal length lens. Now, the question that always comes up is which one is better, a lens or a telescope? It really depends. It depends on the type of lens. It depends on the telescope. It, the, there's just so many factors that go into it that you, you can't have the perfect answer. But I always say go with the telescope if you don't have a long focal length lens, or if you have maybe a lower quality long focal length lens, consider upgrading to a telescope in the future. When we're comparing lenses to telescopes, from the point of view of strictly deep space astrophotography, in the long run, a telescope is gonna win out, and it's mostly because of the accessories available for telescopes. One of the big advantages that telescopes have is you can do something called automate the focusing. Throughout the night, your focus might shift because changes in temperature or seeing conditions might change. You can't automate your camera lens to adjust focus on things like stars, but with telescopes, you can. Telescopes only have a couple of lenses, anywhere from like three to six or seven. When we're talking about camera lenses, those have like 18, 20 different optical elements. All of those different optical elements will reduce the amount of light coming in to the sensor because when light hits a surface, some of that light is reflected out. And so the more optical elements you have, the more the light is gonna get reflected out and the less amount of light is coming in hitting the sensor. When it comes to image quality, you can probably get the same image quality from a high-end lens as you could with a telescope. The main difference is the price of the telescope compared to one of those high-end lenses. Those can be like six, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000, where a telescope like this, which is the Red Cat 51 telescope, is only gonna cost you about $900. But at the end of the day, just use what you have. If you have a long lens, use your long lens. If you wanna get a telescope, get a telescope, it's up to you. Now the telescope I'm using here is the William Optics Red Cat 51 telescope. It's a 51 millimeter telescope. And if you're used to shooting with camera lenses, the 51 millimeters actually means the aperture of the telescope. So the actual diameter of the telescope compared to when you say a 135 millimeter lens, what they're saying is the focal length 
of the lens is 135 millimeters. That's a big difference between telescopes and camera lenses. The focal length of this thing is about 250 millimeters. One thing I want to note too is I love this telescope. It's called the Red Cat and it's got all of these like cat references on here. It's got a paw print and the picture here. It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> the last major piece of equipment you're going to need is a star tracker. And why do you need a star tracker? Well, the stars move over time about 15 degrees every hour, which doesn't seem like a lot. But when you're really zoomed in with a long focal length lens, you're going to really notice that. What the star tracker does is as the stars or your target, like a galaxy or nebula, is moving across the night sky, this is going to allow you to follow it so you don't get those star trails. Now, if you want to do star trails, this isn't the video for you. We're doing deep space astrophotography here, so no star trails. There are a lot of different star trackers out there on the market. You have things like the Move Shoot Move or the Polaris. You've got the Sky Tracker. You've got the Star Adventurers. I've got the Skywatcher Star Adventurer GTI here. This is a great one for doing deep space astrophotography. Honestly, any of the Skywatcher Star Adventurers are great for doing deep space astro because they can hold a good amount of weight. These in particular can hold up to 11 pounds. So when you combine your long focal length lens or your telescope and your camera, you're getting a little bit of weight up there. So you need something like the Star Adventurer to be able to handle all of that while you're tracking the stars. One of the challenges that comes with deep space astrophotography is actually finding your target. Because targets in space are so faint, it can be really difficult to know if you're on target, ready to take a photograph of it. One of the beautiful things about the Star Adventure GTI is it has a built-in computer in it, and we call it a go-to mount. Once you align it and triangulate its position by telling it where a couple stars are, it can find any object in the night sky for you easily so you're not sitting there looking and hoping that you're pointing in the right direction. The other star trackers on the market, like the Sky Guider from Myoptron or the Star Adventurer 2i from Skywatcher, those ones don't have go-to capabilities. What those are are single axis motor star trackers. So once you get your camera set up and you're pointing to a particular part in the sky and you turn it on, it just starts turning the right ascension motor so it actually tracks the stars, where this has gears in both the right ascension and declination axes. The benefit of using one of the single axis motor trackers is they're smaller, they're lightweight, uh, and they're easy to move around. Where something like this is a bit heavier, it costs a bit more, but you do get that go-to capability. So now that we went through the gear, how do you actually attach your camera to the telescope? It's a good question. Well, you gotta use this thing. It's called a T-adapter, and it's standard in the world of astronomy and it uses a particular thread that matches the thread that's on the back of the telescope. So first things first, we have our T adapter and we're going to thread it into the back of the telescope, just like that. And there we go. Now, this is where your camera attaches and you're gonna put your camera right here. And voila, your camera is now attached to your telescope. Now this adapter is specifically made to attach Fuji X-Series cameras to this particular telescope. If you're using other types of telescopes, you're just gonna have to look up which exact one you need to attach your Fuji X-Series camera to that particular telescope. When it comes to deep sky astrophotography, there are no perfect settings. It depends on a number of factors, things like sky brightness, or if it's windy, or if your tracking is really good. I can't tell you exactly what settings to use, but I can give you suggestions on where to start, and then it'll be up to you to adjust them based on your scenario. For example, if you live in the suburbs like I do here, you might be in a, a little bit of a light polluted area just outside of the city. And if that's the case, you're gonna have to use a lower ISO, like maybe ISO 500 or 640, and you're gonna have to do shorter exposure times like 30 seconds or one minute. Or if there's periodic wind coming in, preventing you from doing, let's say two minute exposures, drop it down to one minute. And if you still have nice pinpoint stars, then keep using one minute. But if you're shooting at one minute exposures and you see those tic-tac streaks on your image, then drop it down to 30 seconds or 40 seconds. But again, all you're doing is checking how washed out is the image and how are my stars. If it's too washed out, drop the ISO. If you see tic-tac stars, drop the exposure. Now, what settings should you start with? I usually recommend starting anywhere between 800 and 1600 ISO and then adjusting from there. When it comes to shutter speed, start with 30 seconds. And if your tracking is good, 
bump it up to a minute. If your tracking is still good, bump it up to two minutes. If you can do more than one minute, you're gonna be getting a lot of detail and you're gonna be getting a lot of good data. You don't really need to do too long exposures, otherwise you're gonna get heat buildup, which turns into noise in your final image. Now we're gonna talk about calibration frames and removing as much noise as possible, but to minimize it, you know, stick to four or five minutes at max. But you don't have to do everything I tell you. If you wanna go more, you go for it. So make sure everything is in manual, your ISO, your shutter speed, and your focus. The camera's not made to focus on stars. You're gonna do that manually. This next setting I wanna go over is a little counterintuitive for Fuji. I know Fuji loves boasting about shooting straight out of camera and shooting in JPEG, but when we're doing deep space astrophotography, do not shoot in JPEG, no JPEG. No JPEG. When you go to JPEG, you're losing all of that detail that you can pull out in post-processing when it comes to deep sky astrophotography. You can only get that data when you're shooting in RAW. Shoot in RAW. There are some settings you want to make sure you turn off. Number one is the image stabilization. You don't need that. We're tracking the stars. And two, you want to turn off your long exposure noise reduction. We're going to be doing long exposure noise reduction the astrophotography way, which is with our calibration frames. And last thing, if you're using a telescope instead of a camera lens, make sure you have the setting shoot without lens. There's no electronics in the telescope lens, so the camera doesn't know that there's a lens actually attached to it. When you have that setting turned on, you'll still be able to take photos. The last thing I want to talk about before we head out into the field is calibration frames. So when we're doing deep space astrophotography, we're doing lots and lots and lots of exposures and we're stacking them all together. But those single images that we take are gonna have a lot of noise in them. Now we stack to get rid of a lot of noise, but there is noise that's actually inherent within our imaging train and our sensor. There's just lots of junk in there that we wanna get rid of. So to do that, we take calibration frames and there's three main ones, bias frames, dark frames and flat frames. Bias frames remove noise that's inherent in our sensor. Dark frames removes noise buildup when we take the long exposures and flat frames remove any optical vignetting and dust particles within our optical train. And once we do that, we get nice clean data. And the key to getting really, really good astrophotos is using calibration frames. I'll show you how to take those out in the field. Hey friends, Editing Ian here. One thing I forgot to mention in this video was the importance of having dark skies, getting away from light pollution. When you get away from city lights and go into rural areas, you get better detail on your images because you don't have the noise of light pollution in your images. And if you don't know how to find dark sky sites, check out the video I did. I'll put a link in the description below about how to find a dark sky place. All right, back to the video. So I've got my setup here and first thing I want to do is get it nice and level and have it pointed towards the North Star Polaris because I am going to have to do a polar alignment to make sure that I'm tracking well. The next thing I want to do is make sure that the telescope system is balanced in both the right ascension and declination. And you know you're balanced when you can kind of tap it around and it doesn't favor one side or the other. You know, it's not swinging. Looks like we're nice and balanced in RA. So now I'm gonna lock the RA in this position here where it's kind of level, and I'm now gonna balance the declination. And look at that. Let's go. <laughs> so we're nice and balanced. Now here's an example of what an unbalanced system looks like. So if this is unbalanced, you'll see that it swings when I let go. It's favoring one side over the other, and that puts a strain on the gears, which you don't want. The next thing I'm gonna do is polar aligning the system. I essentially have to get this whole thing perfectly aligned with the North Celestial Pole. What I have to do is dial in my latitude setting to make sure I'm at the proper latitude. And then once I'm roughly pointed to Polaris, there's a little, little scope back here called a polar scope. And when you look through that, it'll have a funny looking crosshair and the app will tell me where I need to put the North Star in that crosshair to make sure that I am polar aligned. So the first thing I notice is that it's a bit low from my position. So this particular tracker has uh, what they call azimuth and altitude adjustments, essentially just left, right, up, down adjustments. And I will use those. So I'll 
get it in that particular spot. I don't know how much more perfect I can get with that. And boom, the system's polar aligned. The next step is to dial in the focus on the system. And the best way to do that is to find a really bright star in the sky and point your system in that direction. So let's point, well, that huge cloud is kind of in the way. So I'm gonna point to Sirius because that's the only thing that's available to me right now. So what I wanna do is focus in on Sirius by zooming in and I have focus peaking turned on but what you want to see is it shrink down to its smallest size so that's out of focus that's way out of focus as I start to bring it into focus there'll be a point where it starts to get bloated again so you want the middle point of where it starts to get bloated like that that's how you know you're in focus when it's the most tiny pinpoint dot all right, so I've got the telescope pointing to the Orion Nebula. You can see Orion right here above my head and his nebulas right here in his uh, sword. <laughs> now the next thing you wanna do is make sure you're on the target and then you wanna frame up the target. And the best way to do that is to crank the ISO on your camera super high, like 6,400 or even more, and do a short exposure, like three, five, or 10 seconds, because one, you're just trying to find the target, and two, you're trying to make sure that the target is in the orientation you want it to be in. Now I'm gonna crank the ISO up to like 6,400, and you always wanna make sure that you use a delay timer, because any shake is gonna show up. So here we go, 6,400 with three seconds. And that's what we've got. Now, once you've found your target and you got the orientation that you like, we're going to adjust the ISO and the shutter speed. We wanna find that sweet spot of good ISO and good exposure time where we don't blow out the image and we have nice round stars. So I'm gonna start with an ISO of 1600 and I'm gonna test my tracking and see if I can go up to one minute. So the image being blown out tells me I need to drop the ISO. And it's really just this game of cat and mouse. It's really just like playing with the settings until you find the right combo. All right, so I'm happy with a 50 second exposure and the ISO of 640. So I'm gonna take as many exposures as I can with the time that I've got. Now remember, I'm in a pretty light polluted area, so I have to be really conservative with my settings. But if you're in a dark sky spot, you can do you know, longer exposures, higher ISO, because you won't have the sky glow like I have. You are gonna want as many photos as possible. If you can shoot all night, shoot all night. I'm gonna take, let's do 20. You're gonna want way more, as many as possible, but we're gonna go with 20. And we're gonna let it run until it's done. All right, I finished my last exposure. And while my images on the target may be done, I'm not done because I still need to do calibration frames. Now you can do these before or after you image, but the most important thing to remember is that when you're taking flat frames, you don't want to change the orientation of your system that you were shooting in when you take those flat frames. Right now, while we're out here, I'm gonna take bias and dark frames, and I'm gonna do those with the lens cap on because I want no light getting in to the sensor. Oh. Where did I put it? I was looking for it and I had it here in my pocket the whole time. So I'm gonna put the cap on to make sure it's nice and dark in there. Anywhere between like 20 and 50 is good. I'm gonna be taking 20 bias frames and I'm gonna be taking 20 dark frames. So to do the bias calibration frames, I'm gonna do the shortest exposure possible that my X-T4 can do. And that's one over 8,000. And I'm gonna keep the ISO the same, all the settings the same. The only thing I'm changing is the exposure time. So I'm gonna take 20 of those. Now that I'm done with my bias frames, I'm gonna take my dark frames. Now the dark frames have to be the same exposure time as what I was shooting my target with. So in this instance, I was shooting 50 second exposures at ISO 640. So I'm gonna take 20 dark frames at 50 second shutter speed with an ISO 640. Got my little Astro homie right here, Vinny. What's up, Vinny? You excited to take dark frames? Yeah, oh no, I think that was a no. <laughs> okay, those dark frames are now done. So the last thing I'm gonna do is take flat frames. There's a couple ways you can do flats. There's lots of info out there on the internet. I'm gonna use my laptop instead. What I do is I put my telescope at a white 
blank screen. I'm going to be taking 20 flat frames, same ISO, uh, and the exposure time is just whatever exposure time I need to get my histogram one third of the way from the left side of the graph. I'm going to take 20 exposures with the histogram at that point, and those are going to be my flat frames. All right, we're almost at the finish line. So the last thing we need to do is take those images of the target that we took, apply the calibration frames we took to those images, then take those calibrated images and stack them all together into a single image. Then we'll stretch the image to bring out the details within the shadows so we can reveal the target that we shot. Now that sounds like a lot of work. Luckily, there's dedicated astronomy software to automate most of that process for us. There's software out there like PixInsight or Deep Sky Stacker. In this video, I'm gonna use a free software called Cyril, and I'll put a link in the description below so you can check it out. Okay, so I've got all of my images of the target that I shot of M42 in its own folder here. Our first step is to go through all of our images to determine which ones are good images and which ones are bad. Now, if you have just a few frames like I do here, you can individually go through them and look through them to see which ones are good and bad. If you have a lot more frames, you're gonna to wanna to use the process that I'm gonna show you using Cyril to go through the images. We call that blinking through images. So we're gonna blink through these images to determine the good and bad ones. So first thing we need to do is open up Cyril. Once we open up Cyril, we have to first select our working directory and that's where all of our images are currently located. So you click the home button at the top and make sure you're in the correct folder. If not, go ahead and find it on your computer. Mine is this astrophotography M42 raw. This is where all of those images of the target I took exist. So I'm gonna select that as our working directory. And now we need to convert these files into something that Cyril can detect because these are Fuji files and we need to convert them into what's called FITS files. So we're gonna hit this plus button and we're going to select all of these and add them. So we have all of our images here and these images we call them light frames and light frame just means the images of the target that we're actually trying to go after so here's our list of light frames here now we just need to select a name for these i'm going to call it blink because we're going to be blinking through these and we're going to go ahead and click convert okay once that's done we'll see a preview image pop up here and you'll notice it's really really dark and that's totally fine that's actually normal most astro images start out in this state here, which is the raw linear state. And so what we need to do is preview the image. So we're going to do what's called an auto stretch at the bottom here where it says linear, you're gonna click that and click the auto stretch button. And so it's just gonna automatically bring up the shadows so we can see what we're working with here. And being in black and white is totally normal. The images are still gonna turn out color, so don't worry. It's just what we're working with right now. We don't need to worry about that. So now we need to go through every single image and check to see which ones are good and which ones are bad. So let's go ahead and do that by clicking this little image stack button here. It's the show hide list of images, and you'll see this window pop up here. And these are all of our images that we have, the blink and then underscore some name. So we're gonna go through every one of these images and select the ones that we don't wanna keep. And what we wanna do is remove the images that are not good. So what determines a good and bad image? Well, a good image is one where if you look at it, let's pick uh, this image for example. We're gonna zoom in, so I'm gonna hit control and mouse wheel up. And you'll notice that, okay, these star shapes, they're not very good. They look like Tic Tacs. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove that. Or you'll notice that some of my images were the test shots that I was doing. So I'm gonna zoom out here. And you'll notice that they were the ones where I was just trying to frame up the image. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove those ones as well. And so you're just gonna go through and remove all of the images that have Tic Tac shaped stars like this one here. You can see these stars are not good. I'm gonna remove this one as well. And you're gonna go through and remove those and just keep the ones where you have nice star shapes. And it's up to you to determine what star shape you deem acceptable because it's all just gonna depend on your tracking and your equipment capability. Now remember, I had some wind when I was shooting, so some of these images are gonna have some slight elongation, but there is some amount of elongation that I'm fine with. So this, I'm gonna say I'm okay with that. 
compared to something like this, I have no idea what happened here. But I can scroll around by clicking control and click and look at that weird stuff going on here. So we're definitely removing that one. And so I'm just gonna go through all my images and remove the ones I don't like. Like this is a example of a great image. Once I've removed all the ones I don't wanna keep, I can go ahead and close this out and head up to my sequence tab up here in the top right and give this a new name. Essentially, we're gonna be exporting all of the good images as their own image type. So I'm gonna call this one good for the good images and I'm gonna hit export sequence. And down here at the bottom, I can see it says export succeeded. Perfect. So now we can take our good images and start the process of calibrating them and stacking them together. So our next step is to create a new directory. I have a new directory here and I have to create folders called biases, darks, flats, and lights. And you have to do this exactly this way because Cyril has an automatic script that will read these folder types and do all of the automatic calibration and stacking for us, but it can only do it properly if we have these named correctly. So you're gonna create these folders in a new directory. So I have mine in astrophotography, M42, M42 Cyril. And in the lights folder, you're gonna go ahead and put all of those images that we just created, the good underscore, whatever the name is. So we've got all of those good frames here in this lights folder. We've got our flat frames in the flats folder. We've got our dark frames in the dark folder. And we've got our bias frames in the bias folder. So once we set that up, we go into serial and set our new directory. This one is the M42 serial and hit open. Perfect. Our next step is to do some automated magic or as we call it auto magic. And we click the scripts button and we'll see one of them called OSC underscore preprocessing. That just stands for one shot color preprocessing. And it's a script that will automate all of that good stuff for us. And you will have a pop-up that says, just make sure you have all of your stuff set up correctly. So you're gonna go ahead and click run script. And you'll see over here that it's running through all of those images, doing the preprocessing, calibration, stacking, all that stuff for us. Okay, we know it's done because it says here, total execution time, one minute, 25 seconds. So that's how long it took to uh, go through all the pre-processing for us. So we're gonna open up that final file that it created by clicking the open button. And you'll notice in your working directory, uh, a bunch of new folders were created. Those were from the automatic process. And you'll see here our result underscore 960s.fit. That's the file that is uh, completed. That's the stacked file. And the number here is actually the total integration time. So the total amount of time I was shooting M42 uh, equated to 960 seconds. Let's go ahead and open it. And boom, here is our image. Check that out. Wow, look at that. Look at the detail, it's gorgeous. This shows up as an auto stretch. This is not actually what the image looks like. If you remember, we had that auto stretch selection already applied. Sometimes when you open it, it might be in its linear state, which is this. And this again is totally normal. This is actually what the image looks like, but we're just gonna perform that auto stretch so we can see what we're working with here. We're gonna stretch the image manually because we can bring out more and better detail than the auto stretch can. During the stacking process, you might end up with some artifacts on the edges of your image. I don't have any here, but you might. So to get rid of those, you wanna crop in the image and you just click and drag, then right click and hit crop. And there you go, you've cropped your image, got rid of those artifacts. Now you'll notice here that I've got a really intense gradient here, and this is from the light pollution of the nearby city that I'm in. We wanna get rid of that. We wanna even out the background so we have a nice flat background. And to do that, we use a process called background extraction. So if we go up to the top left, click this button, image processing, and we click the option background extraction. Now this window will pop up here with a lot of different options. I recommend as you get more comfortable with image processing to look into what each of these actually do. And that'll help you get a better background extraction in the future. But we're gonna keep this simple for now, just so you can get a result. I want you to click generate. Once we click generate, you'll see that a bunch of red squares just pop up. And essentially what the software is asking us to do is tell the software what is background? So it knows what the background is supposed to look like so it can actually even out the image's 
background. What we want to do is make sure we don't have any red squares on the harsh light pollution, uh, the harsh part of the gradient, and we don't want any of these red squares on our target or on any stars. And we can do a couple of things here, but the first thing I want to do is show you the difference between the grid tolerances. So that was a grid tolerance of one. If I drop this to like 0.49, you'll see it's created less red squares around my target and the light pollution. So I'm gonna go ahead and go with a grid tolerance of 0.49. You go ahead and play around with whichever ones work best for your images. And now I need to remove the red squares that are on my object, that are on stars, and that are on the intense gradient that I have. So these red squares, I just hover and left click and it's removing them from my target object. If you have too few, red squares, what you can do is actually just add sample points by finding a blank background spot and clicking and you'll see a red square appears. 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 I'll zoom in here and show you again like that. Some of these red squares have very faint stars in them. That's totally fine. But these ones that have bright stars in them, uh, we want to get rid of. So like this one here might be a little too bright. So I'm going to be on the safe side and remove it and just move the square there. This process is a bit time consuming, but the better you do with this part, the better the background extraction is going to be. So I'm going to go ahead and start adjusting this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and call that good for now. And I'm going to click the button compute background. And we're going to let that run through its process. And once that's done, go ahead and hit apply. And you'll notice here that it actually cleaned up the image very nicely. And you can see that gradient is now removed. So if we go back, that's before and that's after. Nice. The next thing we want to do to get a really nice image is to color calibrate the image. We're going to go to image processing and we're going to go to color calibration and we're going to use the option photometric color calibration. Okay. So this window will pop up and essentially what this is doing is it's comparing the stars in our image to a known source. And then it's going to use that database to calibrate our image to ensure that it has the proper colors. A couple things we need to do is first our focal length of the lens or telescope we were shooting with. So I used uh, 250 millimeters with the red cat and the pixel size. The pixel size of the X-T4 I believe is 3.78 or maybe it's 3.76. Either way, we're going to go ahead and put those in there. And the last thing we have to do before we're done is tell it what target we were actually imaging. So this was M42. So I'm going to type M42 and click the find button. So I'll go ahead and click that and everything else as default is fine. And we'll go ahead and click OK. And we know it's done because it says here in the console that the photometric color calibration has succeeded. So we can go ahead and close this. Next, we want to remove this heavy green cast that we have here because the sensor has a lot of green pixels. Uh, it really tends towards the green side in images. So we're going to go ahead and just balance that out by clicking remove green noise. Default settings are fine. Go ahead, hit apply and boom. Now we have a nice color balanced image here. Finally, we get to stretch the image. So let's remove the auto stretch and go back to the linear state here at the bottom right. Because remember, that's what our image actually looks like. And we're going to manually perform a stretch on it. So under image processing, we're going to click histogram transformation, and we're going to stretch this image on our own. So if we expand this window a bit, you'll see you have your black slider here, you have your midtone slider here in the middle, and you have your whites here. And we're just going to touch the midtone slider and the black slider. So all of our data is here to the far, far left of the histogram, and we want to stretch it out so we can see all of those details that are hidden in the shadows. We're going to go ahead and start sliding this midtone slider and you can see how the histogram starts to move over to the right hand side of the graph a bit. And so we're just going to keep stretching this by sliding this midtone slider, hit apply. You can see it got brighter and we're going to keep sliding this midtone slider and you'll see it get brighter again, hit apply. And you'll notice here we have a lot of the blacks here that we want to clip so we can keep stretching this. So we're going to take the black slider here and move it. And you'll notice how it brings it back to the left side of the histogram. Now you don't want to clip the blacks too far. So if you look at the original histogram here, 
you don't want to get into where the actual data is. You want to be just before it. So we'll go ahead and put the blacks there. I can actually zoom in on the histogram by clicking this plus button. And you can see right here is the original histogram and I wanna get pretty close, but not to where I'm actually clipping it, hit apply. And then I'm gonna zoom back out in the top left, these minus buttons so I can see the graph again. And then you just keep sliding your midtone slider and your blacks slider until you start to stretch the image. And then look at that, it's already starting to come out. Look at those beautiful colors. Hit apply, same thing, stretch it a bit more. There we go, hit apply. And you don't wanna blow it out here. So again, we have a lot more blacks to clip here. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Keeps the background a nice neutral black apply. Maybe stretch it a little bit more. And essentially what you wanna do is stretch it where you're getting the details coming out without blowing out the background, without bringing out too much noise here in the background. You can see it's starting to come out. So I'm gonna hit apply one last time and I'm gonna zoom in and just clip those tiny bit of blacks that are still in there which are right about here. And look at that, apply. And look at all this detail that we pulled out. It is beautiful. Look at all these dust lanes, a little bit of hydrogen in there, this star forming region, it is gorgeous. And we even have this reflection nebula here, awesome stuff. And we did this with very, very little integration time and from a quite light polluted area, about a Bortle 6. Before we call this done, we can deal with the noise that's here in the shadows by going to image processing and clicking noise reduction. And again, default settings are fine here. You can always adjust the settings, look into how they work, but just try the default settings and see what they look like when you apply them. So here's before and here's after. And I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can see. So here we have before and after. So it cleans up that background noise a little bit just to give us a bit of a cleaner image. Now this is ready for whatever you want. You can go ahead and export it as is, as a JPEG, or if you wanna keep working on it in somewhere like Photoshop, you can export it as a TIFF file. You can go ahead up here in the top right corner and you can click this little download button here save the current image in a different name and pick your directory where you want to save it. And you can select what file type you want. TIFF, PNG, JPEG, FITS, whatever you want. And you change the name up here in the top and we'll go ahead and save it. And there we go, our finished M42 image with only 960 seconds of total exposure time. And we still have this beauty showing up. And there you have it, you've got yourself a photo of deep space using your Fujifilm camera. How awesome is that? One thing to note is there's a lot of different ways to process astrophotography data, but the goal of this video is to get you results quickly so you can then start getting out there, practicing, and then build the confidence to be able to start adjusting different settings and different ways of approaching astrophotography. So I hope this really helped you. And if you have any additional questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments and I'll see you all next time.